just want to welcome everybody to the October edition of the Junior Tennis Tour Player Development Series. Uh, each month, we provide players, parents, and coaches with the opportunity to meet ATP, WTA coaches, um, and players to support their encore challenges. Tonight, we're thrilled to have uh, Chris Lewitt, who's a leading expert on Spanish uh, training methodologies. Um, I know Chris needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it for you anyway. Um, Chris has played number one at Cornell University. He's played on the professional tour. Chris is regarded as one of the leading junior player development coaches in the U.S. He's coached numerous number one ranked U.S. junior players, as well as numerous top 10 players. Uh, he's the expert on Spanish training methods, techniques, and biomechanics. He's also written two best-selling books, The Secret of Spanish, the Secret of Spanish Tennis and the Tennis Technique Bible. Um, Chris trains his high-performance players at his uh, private facility in Manchester, where I see he is at now, Manchester, Vermont, um, as well as New York and Connecticut. Um, I have to say that I'm so grateful to call you my friend, someone who's been so supportive of my own son, Cam, for so many years. Um, Chris is also an amazing partner with us at the Junior Tennis Tour, hosting our 12U and 14U events at his amazing facility, two events which we have going on November 11th and 12th um, next month. I have to make the admission that before you and I knew each other and we were friends, I can recall reading the uh, Secrets of Spanish Tennis when my son was like three. Reading, I read it so many times going up and down New Jersey Transit and the New York City subway going back and forth to my office. It eventually fell apart and I had to buy a second one. So I grew up on my tennis um, coaching for my son on the Spanish, um, the, the Secrets of Spanish Tennis. So for me, this is it's always awesome for us to catch up and talk Spanish tennis. And I'm so grateful to have you. So I will... Let the, I saw the overview. It's amazing. I'm looking forward to all of it. And I know the parents will be excited and players will be excited as well to hear everything you've got. So I'm going to let you do your thing and I'll try to stay out of the way. Thanks, Ed. And welcome to everyone. Hi, everybody. Uh, that's such a great intro. I'll just try to live up to that. Uh, that story about you on the train is great. And that reminds me that the book is going on. That book, Secrets of Spanish Tennis, is almost 10 years old now. And we have the brand new edition coming out next summer. So I'm super excited. The manuscript's into the publisher and it's, it's, it's getting prepared right now. Secrets of Spanish Tennis too. So that's going to be even better. Oh, it's great. I, I read it until the binding fell apart on, on the subway every day. <laughs> it was rehearsing all the well, that And that's what I wanted to talk about tonight. I wanted to go through some of the principles in that book. Uh, and that book's been very popular. I have lots of parents who use that book. They use it with their kids and lots of coaches also who reach out to me and say they love the book that helps them with their players. So I guess that's what's important is, is there's stuff in there that that's actionable, that's practical, that parents can use with their kids and that coaches can use if any coaches are interested too. Uh, the, one of the beautiful things about Spanish tennis and the training methodology is the, tr the, the philosophy and the methods are pretty simple. And that's why I think people gravitate towards that. It's, it's, they're easy to comprehend. The drills are, are, I think with the little training, anybody can do the drills and they can take their kids through the paces and, and they can apply the principles from Spanish tennis to their players. So the, I, I, I've always been impressed by the simplicity of the Spanish way of training. So that, that's one of the things I fell in love with years ago when I started traveling to Spain and studying there. So Speaking of the book, the six principles that I talked about in the book were there's uh, an emphasis on footwork and movement and positioning. So I wanted to talk about that and how you can apply that to your training. There's a, a chapter on acceleration and building the forehand weapon. That's a big part of the Spanish method is building a weapon, particularly with the forehand. It, there's a philosophy in Spain that the forehand is the most important shot in the game. So that, that's hard. You know, we can get into that debate. Most people think it's the serve, but for example, Tony Nadal is, believes the forehand is the most important shot in the game. Uh, in Spain, they work a lot on consistency, and so they build very consistent players, and they build players who are good at defense. So even if a player has offensive capabilities, they also have some balance with some defensive capabilities. One of the great things they do in Spain is develop physical beasts, physical players who have just... Uh, uh, incredible stamina. They can outlast any other player in the tournament and players who are very durable and players who are very strong and powerful. So they have a, a, a 
and a kind of an obsession with physical training and off-court conditioning. We can get into that as well. And I'm a big believer in that for my players. And the last chapter that I wrote about, as far as the principles, is this concept of suffering in Spain. And there is a, there's a, a cultural, there's an ethos in Spain that, that you need to suffer to win, to be a great, or to be a great player, you need to suffer during your training and you need to be willing to suffer in your matches. And you hear that a lot from great champions like Nadal. You hear that a lot from Alcaraz. And so we can get into that mindset too. That relates to character development, relates to uh, fighting spirit, it relates to discipline and, and things like that, the, the endurance aspect and the suffering aspect. So we could start at the top and talk about the movement and the positioning. Um, so I don't know if any, you know, the parents are, are watching, they're, they're, they can feel free to ask any questions they have. Ed, if you have any questions, you're a parent and you, you're a developer of your own kids. So you can also let me know uh, if you have any questions, just chime in. But essentially in Spain, they develop great movers. And so one of the things that I work on with a lot of my young players and um, even older players, if they're struggling with their movement, is is how they position in relationship to the ball. And I think that's something that all players can work on regardless of their technique. They can uh, work on their spacing, their measuring the incoming ball. And if you develop a good relationship with the ball and you don't fight the ball, that can help you be more consistent. It can help you hit the ball with more spin. It can help you uh, play with more shape. It can help the fluidity of your swing. It can help your mechanics. Just that alone, having good spacing and having good balance. In Spain, they spend a lot of time on the balance of the player, the posture of the player. So, Ed, I think that would be very helpful for parents to work on with their kids or to be mindful of if they're, if they're watching their kids practice or play. I think, you know, what I talk about with my son is sort of, you know, when we talk about spacing and all those different, I talk about the sort of five pieces, like, you know, depth, being in depth, direction, spin, speed, height, as sort of these things that as a player, you almost need in order to move, because I my background is sort of in movement science. So I always think about that, having those sort of five pieces as like that, almost like that, this little robot processor, like your brain has to process those five things in order to be able to move appropriately and create the space. Yeah. So yeah. And, and what, you're, what you're describing, and, and you know, I'm studying kinesiology now as well. And, and that's one of my favorite sports science subjects. It is that in Spain, they have this idea of receiving the ball, which is a beautiful concept. It's just that it, a lot of times in the US, we focus on, on sort of throwing the ball or hitting, you know, hitting the ball with the racket. And in Spain, they spend a lot, a large amount of the training time on receiving the ball. So that's kind of what we're getting at. Receiving the ball is what you, how you read the incoming ball. You read the spin, you read the pace, you read the incoming depth. And you have to position your body to receive the ball well. You have to position your body so that you're not fighting the ball, so that you're, you're in harmony with the ball. This is like, these are very Spanish concepts, Spanish ideas. So... When the ball's coming, first you need to read it with your eyes, and then you need to move with your feet and get set up with good balance. And then you have to measure the ball, make sure you have uh, good spacing. So that means the, there's several distances that they work on in Spain. And sometimes you can think of it as like three spaces or four spaces that you have to measure, or four distances that you have, three or four distances. You have the, the distance from the ground up. So in Spain, they work a lot on receiving the ball between your hips and your shoulders. So I, I, you hit the ball, you try to hit the ball at a good contact point. In terms of height, you have the distance in terms of in front of your body. So you have to meet the ball out in front. Um, and you don't want to be late. So you want, so that, that's part of being out in front. And then you have the distance from like your hip out wide to the right. And that's like the radius of the swing. You want to have a good distance there. So there's this concept of, of measuring these distances and trying to put yourself in the optimal position. And they just relentlessly, they'll drill that with hand feeding, they'll drill that with, with racket, uh, with baskets. I just came back from two trips to Spain and the, the drilling was relentless. Sometimes it's too much for, for, uh, for some kids who are not used to that traveling to Spain. Sometimes the baskets can be kind of overwhelming, but you can do that with live ball. If you're doing live ball sessions and your kids are hitting or playing points, you can you can stand there and look very carefully and watch. Don't just watch the how they're gripping the racket or how they're swinging. Try to watch their orientation. Try to watch the way the body is positioned in relationship to the ball. 
try to watch if if the the players in in harmony with the ball or are they fighting the ball. So uh, that's what I would encourage parents and coaches to try to reorient how they watch a player play, how they watch a player hit, and don't just focus on what the racket's doing. Try to focus on. It takes a little practice, but you watch the player, you watch their torso, you watch their body position, and then you watch the incoming ball, and you try to judge whether they're measuring well or not. You know, I think that to me, that that's something that I think about. You know, always like posture. And I, I'm a, uh, you know, obsessed with joint angles and elbow position. So I also I say with my son, if if step one in this sort of ready position, what we're trying to accomplish this unit turn establishes the spacing. So like, how do we? If step one is good, step three might be pretty good as well. But so it's like a matter of just you know, like something like the kinetic chain, you know. But yeah, yeah. So I, if you, you get into technique and biomechanics, so. What I'm suggesting is in a very practical way, you don't have to adjust mechanics or technique with sure. this method because you're, you're just working on spacing. And, but you, obviously, you can dig into the biomechanics. That's a little more. In Spain, they're not very technical, like just in general. The whole country is not. If you go, you know, you're going to be disappointed if you want biomechanical analysis. In Spain. They're, they're just not very. They're not very into tech. They're a little bit behind in terms of tech. They're a little bit behind in terms of biomechanical study. In terms of video analysis, that's something they could do a lot better in Spain. But so this spacing concept, if you have good spacing, for example, you mentioned joint angles, you're going to get a more obtuse angle in the arm. Like your arm's not going to be as acute. You're not going to be as jammed up with the elbow in terms of extension. So right away, if you're positioning better, you should get better extension through your shots without even having to harp on it too much. You should be able to get better ball rotation if you're meeting the ball early. It's going to help with some of those aspects. You're going to get better extension. Extension in Spain have a great, some great phrases for it. They call it accompanying the ball or to go with the ball, to throw your racket along the path of the ball, to go out along the line of the ball. That's a big thing in Spain, the extension. But it starts with good spacing. If you're not in good spacing, it's hard to extend well. Absolutely. No, definitely. So, so, you know, one of the key things I know, I mean, I myself was a little was talking about just racket head speed and just being able to generate that racket head speed, you know, so yeah. I think that's something that I don't know how much focus is put on with kids in the sort of earlier developmental years. But I felt like for me, that was something that I really spent a lot of time on. Particularly well, I think you're smart. Like if you look at Cam, he's got a tremendous forehand. So I think you, you sort of, you were right to do that, you know, really smart to do that with him. And that's one of the pillars in Spain. That's the second chapter in my book is building the racket speed, building the, and primarily the four, and it can be the back end too, but there's a number of drills that they use and to work on the spacing. And usually you start that with hand feeding. You you, so any parent can do it. Any coach can just take some balls and you toss them softly to your player. You move them around, you work on their spacing, or you can do it live ball. With the racket speed and acceleration, that's like a constant drumbeat in Spain. They're always looking for the player to accelerate. They're looking for elasticity and they're looking for the, the whip of the racket through the hitting zone. And there's, they have exercises for that. I detail a lot of those in my book. I have a lot of them on like my YouTube channel. Or there's a lot of resources out there to find uh, those exercises. If parents need more, they're not sure. Like, I, I want this to be useful for people. So if parents are, they need videos or some visual help, just... Just have them connect them to me, Ed, and I can send them. I can send them videos, or we have a whole website for the book with videos, for example. But um, yeah, there's like there's a whole series of exercises, primary from Luis Bruguera. Luis Bruguera is one of the most famous coaches in Spain, and he developed this series of drills to overload the arm and to build racket speed and build acceleration and to build a heavy ball with the forehand. So that is a, a huge thing in Spain. I see lots of juniors who are maybe 10, 11, 12, or 13, 14, 15, and they haven't really learned to crack the ball. They don't really have a big weapon with the forehand. And I think that's a developmental mistake. You know, that, that starts young. It starts in the mindset. You teach a kid to be aggressive. You teach a kid to really, uh, to, to, to have no fear when they, when they hit the forehand or any shot, uh, but primarily, just primarily forehand in this example. And you, so it's, it's, men, it's mental, but it's also physical. You, you don't want to be tight. You want your arm to be loose and elastic. You need the spacing to generate the pace. You need spacing to generate the pacing. And, uh, and then preferably you hit the ball not totally flat. In Spain, they, they do 
they do like a, a topspin ball, although you do see some players from Spain who also hit flatter balls, like, like a Batista Agud. Or, there are some examples of that. But uh, primarily, like in the Bruguera system in Spain, they like topspin because it, the ball runs and it has more, more of a big bounce and it's tougher to return. Uh, for, if you have a girl or a female player, you might not emphasize the topspin as much. But sometimes they're not able to generate as much racket head speed and RPM on the, on the women's side. I think I've, I thought about, you know, racket head speed was always something that was really important for me when I was developing Cam's game, just because, again, that forehand weapon, like building that right away, I think. I think what made it, I think, a byproduct that are able to create that, I think, was a lot of maybe that Spanish style of, like, hand feeding the ball. Like, I've always felt like, you know, when I watch a lesson or I watch a session from, like, a lot of coaches, you know, they're, they're 70 feet away giving instruction. They're not on top. And I was coaching – I worked Major League Baseball, I worked at LPGA, I worked a lot of professional athletes in different areas. One thing I will say is like, I was always on top of my athletes. And I think being on top of them, being on the same side of the court, being able to hand feed and give instruction and really see what's going on, you know, and be able to deliver it back was was part of the coaching philosophy for me, you know, but also with him, but also giving him that dead ball that requires you to generate that pace with that racket head speed. Like that was yeah. it. Like, I've been the dead ball. I've been, I mean, I think the dead ball is the way for me was the way at a very early age to create that racket head speed. And once you find that those contact points through spacing, I think it builds the confidence in these kids that that forehand or whatever strike becomes that real weapon. When you can take that thing early out in front, it feels like there's a lot of confidence. I feel like gains through that. Yeah, and that, that's part of the system in Spain, and that's something you can take and use here in the U.S. with, with, with your players or your kids. You know, you can toss it softly, a dead ball toss. The ball has very little pace. It does, you, you wouldn't think it would work, you know, because, it's, yeah. because the game is so fast now. It, it's sort of at odds with, with the speed of the game, but what it does is it forces you to use your kinetic chain really well. And, and you have to generate all the pace yourself, which is similar to playing on clay. That's why you need that skill to develop, uh, to hit the ball heavy on clay, because you don't get a lot of pace from, the, from clay courts to the ball. And at the same time, I think there's a there's benefit to feeding the ball fast because you develop the nervous system, the reactions. I have players here who I'm working, I'm doing a little bit of both with some, some of the young kids I'm working with right now. Uh, and I think that's like the best of both worlds. You can do... Uh, dead, like slow dead feeds to develop the kinetic chain and then you can do faster feeds and, and to work on quick reaction and nervous system training and uh, quick feet, footwork moves and things like that so I think it's good to combine both but that is one of the secrets of Spanish tennis is that that slow feed and they, they often are up close right on top of the player like you said that's a big part of Spanish training the hand feeding up close and they that forces the player to do a lot of repetitions and success and you do it in succession to overload the arm and the body to a certain extent i think like you know for us it was teaching like at a very very early age like what the kinetic chain was what it, was it, all the parts of things and and really like you know we still ground force we talk about ground force all the time you know how generating power pace spin you know all from the ground you know and i think when you hand feed someone they force them to do it so yeah i, I always love that idea yeah one of the emphasis one of the emphases they emphasize a lot in spain that when you try to work on racket head speed and you try to develop power, you, you keep a very quiet body, keep a very quiet head. Obviously, you're going to rotate your, your hips and trunk, but, but there shouldn't be extraneous movements. You shouldn't be off balance. You can leave the ground, but it has to be a controlled uh, explosion off the ground. So they just spend a lot of time with the posture and the control of the head as the arm is accelerating and as the trunk and hips are rotating. And... That's how they're able to generate power, but with control. Like the, the, the goal is still control. It's not just swinging wildly. And that's where a lot of uh, parents, coaches sometimes lose it. They ask a player to swing faster and the player loses control of their body and they start spraying the ball a lot. And that's what you don't want that. You want a player to learn to accelerate and whip, but in a very calm, uh, the, with a stable, calm body, which is... Um, not easy to learn. That's why, you know, it's not easy to learn that. But when you get that, it's really beautiful. You know, you get that rotation, you get that fast arm, you get that racket speed, but the, the body parts that shouldn't be moving too fast are calm, you know. 
I think it was, you watched it like this beautiful, like the inside out forehands. I was watching, uh, I was watching Swiss indoor. I was watching like Holger Rune sitting like run, these run around, running around these backhands, sitting in these forehands. Like that, it's it's still, but it's, it's violent, but still. Right. There's like that 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 contrast of yes. yin and yang, violence, but but calmness. That's right. And you, you mentioned the run around. That's a big part of Spanish training. That easy for parents to work on, easy for coaches to work on, players can work on it. Uh, you try to take balls that are sort of neutral in the middle. You try to move to the left and you use your, your they call it the inverted forehand or the drive invertido, which is a great name. And Tony Nadal calls it the drive, inver the inverted drive. where You go around, you play inside out or inside in, and you try to dominate with your forehand. Interestingly, it's not just tactics, but it's also very good for the eyes and the footwork. When, when you practice going to the left, most players are not very comfortable moving in that direction. It's very good for the spatial orientation, the relationship with the ball, working on the positioning. So it's, it's for the eyes and the feet, but also, of course, later on, it's for the tactics where you want to try to command the, the game with your forehand inside out, inside in. Like you see, like with the footwork, like that sort of like double, like sort of runner, that sort of double sort of crossover to Alcaraz does to set up the inside out forehand. It's like that double, that footwork. Yeah, you have some you have some different footworks that players use to move to the left. There's a few different options. If it's slower, you can shuffle over. Usually you load a semi-open stance. I usually teach a semi-open stance and going airborne from that position. You can cross behind. You can also sprint running backwards. A lot of players will do that when they want to move their fastest. So you have those three basic options to move to the left. And sometimes you see the pros combine different movements to the left well, mechanically uh, in terms of footwork. So you have some different footwork options there and how to get around the ball. But, but the mindset is I'm going to try to dominate the, the point with my forehand. I'm going to try to dictate with my forehand. I'm going to try to take my weapon and, and pressure the other player with my forehand. And it doesn't work as well here in New York if the courts are really fast. If the courts are really fast, you're going to have to play more backhands. But if you're on clay or the court is a bit slower, you will have much more opportunity to move to the left because of the speed of the ball. Oh, definitely. So I I was looking at sort of the next topic in your overview was like consistency, and I actually spent uh, this past weekend at Lafitasi USA playoffs and got to watch cool. it. Uh, Cam played. Oh, yeah. Yes, it can played, and we uh, so had the top uh, thirty-two kids there. And one one thing the, I think you recognize, or at least I, I recognize in watching, you know, a lot a lot of matches, his matches, everybody's matches over the last couple of days, you know, and traveling the country watching his junior, his higher level, you know, Orange Bowl, Eddie Her, you know, Easter Bowl, whatever you name it, all these sort of the higher level kids have the ability to be consistent. They can play four or five good balls to very specific tiny targets and obviously done over time. But to me, that's it. That's, I mean, we, I, I always feel like we spend a lot of time in our serve plus one, return plus one, serve plus two, return plus two tactics to like set up these patterns of play. But once you, once that falls out, we're like, you know, two, one patterns and things like that, that we'll work on with Cam and like sort of creating these sort of tactical things. But at the end of the day, once that breaks down and you're at it, you're in that third or fourth shot. Like, can you hit four or five consistent balls to a real, to a like legitimate target in you know on a dime? That's I agree with that. I agree with that 100. I think at the top of the country, you see a much higher level of consistency. All of the young players who want to play nationals, who want to go 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 far at nationals, win nationals. I always we're working on consistency from day one. It's it's. Um, it's a very interesting topic. What you said about the first four shots and rallies, let's say from five to eight and rallies from nine plus, there's still a good portion of points that are over five shots. And oh, absolutely. What, I would like to say that I agree with Emilio Sanchez, the famous Spanish player and coach. And he says when the when they're important moments, and this is something that Craig O'Shaughnessy hasn't really described, but the important moments tend to go longer. In the match because both players are usually a little tighter and so you see sort of an aggregate during the critical moments of a match you see more you see more points that are aggregating towards uh over four shots in those critical moments so so you, you know i think like you're saying if you can make the first shot after the serve and be aggressive it's fantastic but sometimes you're going to have to run you're going to have to defend we talked about defense a little bit later may have a 
a decent defense. And, you know, some players are going to play a bit more defensively than others. Some players are going to be very, very aggressive, you know, but... Um, so that consistency... of practices like that. We have to set up practices where we could, we could spend two hours on just a particular serve plus one, serve plus, uh, return plus one pattern in a particular practice and ingrain that into like your brain, knowing statistically, like, all right, if I land, if my serve is in this location, like, you know, section one in the deuce court, I know that 74% of the time statistically that ball is going to come back to this area of the court so I can set up my plus one ball. But then is that also that part of that practice that, yeah, like they, that shot tolerance where you have to be able to hit these sort of consistent balls, you know, you know, 20 plus balls, 15, 20 plus balls, you know, just to have that endurance because yeah, like you said, the, the key points, everybody plays a little more margin. They're not, so you're going to be in these long rallies. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it, there may not be as many of them, but they're going to come at critical yeah. junctures. Exactly. And so you have to watch out for that. So there's a lot of kids. It's not as, it's not as exciting sometimes to work on that stuff. It's not as some kids don't like to grind, you know? And I think it's, most top juniors in the country have a pretty good grinding game. They can sit, sit back and make a lot of balls if it's bad weather or if or the game's a little off. You know, they can they can get through a match if they're not on their A game. And I think that's a valuable um, aspect to work towards. Um, I think that's it for parents too. Like they, you know, they want to see when I mean, they look at coaches or look at practice. They sit on, on these practice. They look and it's it's not the sexy stuff. I mean, look, I teach movement science. It's not the sexy stuff, but it's the stuff that's going to keep you in the game. You know, so like yeah. nobody wants to work on, you know, posture, balance, mobility, stability, joint integrity. But to me, maybe it's because that's my world, but like every great athlete, no matter what sport you play, has those has those capabilities. And yeah, it's not sexy. Everybody wants to throw money at these other things, you know, but at the end of the day, if you can't move, if you don't have all these other pieces, I don't know how you do it. Yeah, I, I still I still love the the philosophy in Spain where I like that. I've written about this a lot. I've done a lot of videos on this. I just talk about how if you don't, it's great to be an aggressive player. There's some kids, their personalities are not really wired that way. And it's, it's, that's, it's like an okay thing in Spain. Like it's okay to grind. It's okay to defend. There's a lot of no honor in like grinding out a tough point and defending well. And I, you don't get that too much from coaches and even from parents here in the U.S. The kids are usually programmed to attack. And like, if they're not attacking, it's sort of like a crime. But I, think like, I, I appreciate the blue collar way of, of, of grinding and playing. And I think that's what's missing. Yeah, from, from, yeah I mean, at, from the, at, at the same time, sometimes in Spain, they overdo that. And players, you know, I've seen players who spend a lot of time in Spain and, and they're a bit too conservative and maybe they don't step up enough. And that's, that's been a knock on Spain, on Spanish training. Uh, in some academies in Spain, players aren't, you know, taking the ball on the rise enough. Some players aren't moving to the net enough, you know. So that's definitely something, you know, it goes both ways. But I just like to see a balanced, a relatively balanced game. Even if the kid's really aggressive, I like to know that they can, they can, like you said, they can be steady when they need to be steady. And I think that's a good quality to have. A lot of the kids, they see the pros, they see Alcaraz and, and all of the amazing shots that he does, but they don't realize that a guy like that, you know, at 10, 11, 12, that guy was grinding a lot of balls, learning how to be steady. And the kids just want what they see on Instagram or on, on tennis TV. And they don't realize that, that there's years of foundational work are happening before you can start, you know, just unleashing the drop shots and the power forehands. And I try to explain, explain that to my students and say, look, you've got to have a good foundation. And then on that foundation, we can build all these wonderful weapons, you know. Yeah, no, and and that's I think it's the patience. I think it's the patience that the parents often don't have. It's the patience that the kids don't have because they everybody it's, we're in this like instant gratification society where everybody wants the outcome so quickly. Yeah. Kids and parents too. Yeah. I think they think when they you know make these investments in time and all these different things, they want to see it now. But they, I mean, a lot of these parents, frankly, were never athletes, <laughs> so they don't even understand the concept of what it takes to to build a foundation, an athletic foundation. Or to uh, you know to do well, a, lot, a lot of the parents I work with are very good athletes and they know yeah yeah them. yeah no sure sure I got a lot okay. of I got a lot of smart athletic parents running the nice show with me. That. Uh, yeah it's nice it helps me it helps me do my job better 
And I consider parents a team. I, for me, parents are part of my are my best asset. They're on my yeah. we're all we're a team together. And I work I have a great I I try to work hand in hand with all the parents that I, the kids that I work with. And I think that's that's unusual as a philosophy. Um, yeah. I yeah. wanted to say yeah. that being consistent. I I wanted to just before we move on that that being consistent doesn't mean you're a defensive player. And so, a lot of times. That's that's equated. Like if I'm consistent, I must not be. I'm being defensive. But no, you're waiting for your opportunity ball. You're 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 building and structuring a point in a responsible way. That's that's different. I would also like to say that being consistent doesn't mean pushing. Doesn't mean that. <laughs> moving balls. Being consistent. The idea is to be consistent with really good racket speed. Getting back to the, the second principle that we talked about, because you want to accelerate through all your balls and not push. And so. I would, I would, I just want to make that clear. We don't want kids decelerating and just guiding the ball, not moving their feet well, not accelerating well. We want them to hit the ball strong but steady. I like that you see, like, there's no, I feel like there's, you know, there's such a focus on, you know, for whatever reason in, in this early years in, in winning, the, the parents want to see the kids win. The kids want to win, rightfully so. I mean, they're young, they will, you know, so this pushing, these moon ball tactics, all these things that aren't going to bring you to the level, you know, past a certain point. You can't build a game on that, I don't think, long term. Not for not with the aspirations that these players and parents seem to have. You know, so I agree, like being a defensive player versus a pusher is a it's, much Yeah, player. it's it's not good for the long term, but what those types of kids have figured out that I respect a lot is they've learned to keep the ball in play and so, they've learned to disturb Yes. the other player without power generally yes. so you usually see two types of junior players you see the ones that run and just gun everything <laughs> they just go for broke on everything and they don't rally or you see like the, the, the on the opposite extreme you see kids who are who push and just you know dig out a lot of balls and get the get the get get the balls in the net a lot um i really respect because the kid the kids that that push like that they're they're lost like you said they're not gonna, they're gonna they're gonna have big problems later on but they've learned they've stumbled on some important wisdom of tactics that getting the ball in and not making a lot of mistakes wins a lot it helps you win a lot of matches because those kids have a lot of trophies too and they've also learned that they a ways to disturb their opponent that's not necessarily related to pace because most kids think the only way that they can win a point is with pace which is not always true so there, there's some things that they've learned that's very mature. But on the other hand, they probably have technical deficiencies. They probably have a lot of issues that's, that's preventing them from accelerating well and hitting the ball with, and building a weapon, you know. So, you know, I, I think it cuts both ways. But uh, that's why you can sometimes see a player who has very poor technique, but who's fast, gets a lot of balls in play, and they're smart. And they win a lot. They can they can beat players with very pretty strokes because they have they've learned a lot of they they've uh, learned a lot of things tactically that other players with pretty strokes haven't. Sometimes it's not just how your strokes look. You know, so you want to have the pretty strokes and the smarts <laughs> and the weapons and and the way ways you know the creativity. You want to have all of them together. Yeah, definitely. So so let's talk about the defensive piece then because we're talking about this the the what might appear to the untrained eye, the pusher as like the defensive person, but what does real defense look like? What is that? Ideally, ideally you want to defend with racket speed. So that's something that, uh, something that parents can look for, coaches can look for. When a player moves into the corners or when a player moves into the recesses of the court or they're pushed back under pressure, you don't want them to tighten up and decelerate, which is really common because you're under pressure, you're on the run, you're getting pushed back and you naturally tense up, you know? So one of the concepts they have in Spain is aggressive defense. I like that term. It, it uh, sounds oxymoronic or paradoxical, but it's the idea of when you're in trouble, you try to loosen up and you, and you accelerate. Generally, you try to play with spin. Good defense usually has good top spin. Most of the kids that I see who have rudimentary defenses, they usually defend by pushing the ball, by decelerating. Um, There's a lot of blocking, a lot of pushing. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of blocking. The 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 way they see it in Spain is when you're in trouble, you try to play heavy. And the only way to play heavy is with racket speed. So you have to fight against the tendency to be very, very safe with your shot. You have to 
accelerate and generate. If you can generate good heaviness on your defense, it's going to help you get out of trouble and get back to neutral in the point, maybe flip the table, you know, turn the tables and get back on the offense. And defense, defense is a willingness to move back into the, into the recesses of the court. A lot of players, I work with many, many players who literally only patrol a small portion of the baseline and will never move off that, that place. And I just believe, even if you're a very aggressive player, there's a time where you may get pushed back. You may, you may have to retreat a little. You may have to go into the corner. And you have to be comfortable in those uncomfortable places. That's what defense is. And so some kids have literally never journeyed into like the, the, the different the depths of the court or the sides of the court. They literally just don't even know what's going on over there. And so you can play like that, but you're just going to be limited. If you're playing a good player who stretches you out, or a good player who 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 is able to push you back, you're going to be very uncomfortable. So I just believe that that's important. It may be a smaller percentage of your training. You may be much more aggressive. You know, but that's fine. But I just think you should have you should have the ability to defend if you get into trouble. Usually on your service games, you can you can run the show. If you have a good serve and a good serve plus one. You can run the show. You can. Can hold easily, but what about on the return games? Play, play a good server. You're going to have to run and defend a little. You know, you're going to have to try to scrap out some points. You know, I just think that's fundamental. Yeah, that's great. So I guess that sort of leads into the piece of talking about sort of the physical conditioning to be able to do it, because that you know that I mean, that's part of we talked about sort of the shot tolerance, being aggressive on uh, you know, and needing some physical conditioning to do that. But then in terms of the defense, I mean that. You know, what is what does the physical physical conditioning look like in Spain? What is a, like a workout routine look like? What do they focus on? I think that's interesting to me. Yeah, I found it fascinating too because I'm I'm, I'm also a student of exercise science and I, I I'm really into strength and conditioning and kinesiology. So they have really good exercise scientists in Spain. They do a great job off the court with movement training and they. Uh, and agility and, and overall strength and conditioning. Uh, they usually, one of the hallmarks is twice a day fitness. So they do two full sessions of fitness a day, which is a lot coming from the US. Uh, sometimes that can be an hour and a half or two one and a half hour sessions or a two hour, you know, hour and 45 minutes and then another hour in the afternoon along with two sessions of tennis. Uh, so that can be a very different type of training day versus most. The typical academy maybe does an hour of fitness, you know, they plug it in somewhere. Like in Spain, the fitness is front and center. Like it's, it's, it's on par with the tennis training. Sometimes it, it's, it's the priority over the tennis training. So for some people, it's too much and they, they don't like that feel. They don't like the, the, that, that prioritization. And for some Kids and tennis players, they love it. Like they, they, they start, they, they get into that system or that method and they, they can't get enough. They, they love the flow of the day, two fitness sessions a day. And um, in Spain, they really truly believe that you need to be the fittest person in the tournament. Like that, that's part of the warrior ethos. That's part of the warrior mentality. Uh, if the match goes longer, they that you have to be the last one standing. You have to be the one that's less fatigued. So it's just a big part. It, it sort of binds everything together that we that we talked about uh, because you can't move well if you're not fit. You can't defend well if you're not fit. You can't run well if you're not fit. You can't hit the ball with big weapon if you're not strong. And you can't be consistent if you're not fit because if you start sucking wind or your heart rate is too high, you're going to lose your decision-making capability. You're going to lose your control of your emotions. You're going to, you know, everything's going to fall apart. You can't really have any of the stuff we, we've been talking about without the fitness part. And so that's where I see a lot of, I try to advise a lot of parents and uh, families. I say, look, we can do all this really good stuff. We can build beautiful technique. We can work on this. We can build weapons. We can do this. But if, if you don't want to do fitness, I mean, I don't think you're going to win that much. You're not going to. You know, you, you're going to look real good, but because that's where, you know, when it gets tight in the match, it's to a third set, when the conditions are really tough, you go to nationals and it's humid and hot. Like you you got to have that conditioning aspect. A lot of the kids here in New York are low on their conditioning. 
one of the reasons is they're so pressed for time. Everyone's on a time crunch. The kids are rushing to get to tennis practice. A lot of the kids, I have a lot of kids from New York City. They have a ton of homework. They have logistical problems getting from A to B after school. And, and like what usually gets chopped off is the fitness. Like the fitness gets chopped off first because you got to play tennis. You can't, you can't skip tennis because you're a tennis player. So usually the fitness gets cut and those kids can do very well in the East, especially in the winter indoors. And then they go to nationals and they have big problems. They, they can play with anybody, but they can't endure. They can't, they can't last. And so typically you'll see like a talented kid from the East, like win around third, three sets, but the next day crash, you know, like they can't, they can't win the next round because they're just too sore, or, you know, or you'll see a kid go to the round of 16 and then they just run out of gas, you know, like they, like they can play with anyone, but, but they're just not going to be able to outlast kids from Florida, SoCal, or a lot of the academy kids and things like that. So that's like a big thing. It's really huge, especially for very, very apropos to the situation here in New York, New Jersey, you know, tri-state area, that kind of thing. You always think about like, you know, when I, when I was coming up with like, you know, how do you build this sort of, you know, prototype athlete person, I always thought of like building the athlete first. You know, I, I would spend time in my early years and before my son was born, so I'm talking through this with coaches or people who played on tour for a very short period of time and became like hitting partner, all these different things that they had done. And I kept saying, like, you know, if you could do it all over again, what, what would you what would you do differently? And some of the and some of the conversations I had, and it seemed like there's always that piece in those conversations that sort of like resonated with the idea that people had said, look, my parents gave me the best technical instruction money you can buy. I had all the technique, I had all these things, I had all the tax, all the, but at the end of the day, when they stepped foot into like a challenger, a future, whatever it was, it, these were animals. These were people from, on a different level athletically. Mm -hmm. it, there was nothing that was going to save them if they didn't have that, uh, that physical ability to like endure, like you said, endure, to suffer, to play this incredible defense, to have the strength to grind out these matches to be physically sort of dominant. And yeah, so that was, to me, it was always, if you build the athlete first, you know, and you combine it with all these brilliant things that you're doing with everybody, then it's, you have this sort of marriage of both worlds. And that's how you build this sort of like prototype. Yeah, and that, and that physical capacity can be intermatch or it can be intermatch. So it can be in the one match itself, being able to get through one match, but it's also being able to come back and play the yeah. second match of the day <laughs> and play doubles and then actually to do it again and again and again to win a big national, like win a super or something. You, you, tremendous stamina you have to have and the tremendous resilience. Your body has to recover well. So there's, you know, a, a, one other thing they do is they spend a lot of time in injury prevention. I talk about that yeah. in the book. I, I, I work on that relentlessly with my, uh, my students, my families. I, I lost my career to injuries. It's something very near and dear to my heart. So I, I'm, very, I'm similarly obsessed with staying healthy because, uh, to me, one of the most uh, under, undervalued talents is durability. When, you, know, you don't hear people, when people assess talent, they never talk about durability. They never talk about resiliency. And to me, that's one of the most important things is you have someone who, who's able to stay healthy, an athlete who's able to stay healthy, to recover well, to recover quickly. And if they do get, uh, not to get injured at all, but if they do get injured, they, they come back uh, relatively fast. And that to me is a very important part of becoming a professional player. You see many, many talented players who don't make it because of injuries. And you see some of the greatest in the world, like I believe Roger Federer played how many years without a major injury? You know, decades. But it's, it's incredible considering the amount of volume these guys are playing. Like day in and day out, they can stay healthy, and that's that's key to becoming a top pro. It's key to becoming a, a, a great player, great junior player. And you know, I always say, if you're injured, you're not going to win that big trophy. You know, so I just talked to my side joker. I said, don't get old, don't get hurt. Those are two things as an athlete that can't happen. <laughs> you know, it's hard though. It's hard though. My my son, like I trained my son in cross country and track, and he had a uh, just terrible injury. He, he had had a femur stress fracture the last six months out, six months recovery, terribly unlucky. He's going through a big growth spurt, and um, you know, as a runner, that's a devastating injury. And and, and we try, you know, those are the things you you try so hard to avoid as a parent in any sport, as you develop as a coach. And those are the things you want to try to prevent. You want to do everything in your power 
to prevent major injuries that can that can cause a, a loss of momentum in a kid's development. You know, really like you look, at, you look at tennis, you look at so many sports where these repetitive overuse injuries. Like, I mean, you can scroll through an Instagram account and you see these 10, 11 year old kids with casts on their arms, injured, out, surgeries at 10, 11 years old. You know, it's, and you think, you know, this is heavy volume of work. There's a sort of like at some point, I think there's just, you know, there's diminishing returns on this volume. You know, there's like the striking that right balance on people like you with, you know, with an educated eye. I think, you know, you got a lot of coaches out there just like, look, if you're willing to pay for it, come on, let's keep going. You know, but you have someone like self who's actually training these kids at this highest level. It's not the, the, the hometown coach who doesn't have the, maybe the experience of the eye or the, the that you might have. But, but to me, to me, this topic is one of the, the biggest challenges of junior development in any sport, particularly for tennis players. Is, how do you manage the, the adult volume, the intensity of the training? How do you prevent uh, overuse injuries? But because but, you also need to train big, like the, the, to be a, a champion, you have to play a lot. And you have to train like an animal. So like balancing that, uh, parents and coaches, like being very uh, close to their player, feeling their player, uh, maybe even using, you know, there's a lot of technology now that you can use to measure uh how 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 where a player is in terms of recovery and you know there there are a lot of uh, biomarkers that you can track now as well if you like if you're into the tech and the science science aspect it's just really being in touch with your player and knowing when to push when to when to when to to play it a little safer it's it's a very very it's very tough to do well and sometimes even if you do everything right you still get a lot so it's just those are the that sometimes can happen, unfortunately. And I think which I feel like what you notice when you look at you know you get players on tour, you look at like these high level collegiate players. The parents aren't far from the player, you know. In some cases, you know, I think they 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 keep an eye. They have an eye on these players. You know, we see at the pro tour, see all these parents involved. They're involved. They they've never left. You know, I think so. You know, there's, there's a balance. There's also that balance for the parent of like how much do I be involved? How much do I? give the reins to someone else, how much, but at the end of the day, they know their kids physically, you know, as well. So, you know, when to pause, it's got, I think it, like, it takes a team. It takes a village to raise this great player, you know, and everybody has a role in it. Kind of the parent has some role and says, okay, at some point, like, I know my kid well enough that he, he needs, he needs, you know, a, a pause for, for a day or whatever it is. But like, I think, yeah, that's it. More isn't more. And I think that's what it feels like. You see with a lot of parents and, and the coach and, you know, the sort of like these charlatan coaches are never going to say, you know, it's too much. You know, if, if the parents are opening the checkbook, it's always going to be time to train, you know, and sadly, you know, so I think it takes, you know, someone like yourself or someone, you know, people with this credibility to say, no, it's, we're going we're gonna to put the brakes on for a second and make sure we're, we're playing the long game here. We're not playing this, you know, short game to win a couple, uh, you know, um, you know, L3 championships, take another picture for Facebook, you know. So I don't know. It's, it's, it's about yeah, it, it, it's, it's a really it's a really tough. This, it raises a lot of tough developmental questions because yeah. some, some parents are so conservative. They think they do their kids a disservice. Sure, I agree. I, I've yeah. talked to many parents to tell them they might. Sometimes they're doctors, or they have they had they know a doctor who told them this, yeah. and they they they're afraid to train. Like they're they're afraid to train hard. They're too too safe, you know. And so we're just gonna wait. We're just gonna wait till my kid's a little older, and and the, world the more you wait. Five. The more you wait, the gap between, you know, your player and the kids who are are, are killing it is, becomes too great and you can't catch up. And on the other end, there are many, like you said, there's many examples of parents maybe or coaches push too much, you know, um, and and unfortunately you have many stories of injury. So it, it's it's really tough. It's a really tough balancing act. And it is. I, the idea, yeah, I agree that like people... You know, I, I see that too. And like, even like my junior coaching and anyone like kids who play sports that aren't, that aren't tennis that I coach, like it's the parents, there is this sort of like, you know, like they're made of glass, you know, and then unfortunately the world will pass you by. If you wait, the world, I mean, the world's passing you by every day that you are not consistently doing this. Yeah, because, because at the end, it, it also depends on your goals. Like if you sure. want to be truly great, like if you want to win a grand slam, you know, I, I've never coached a grand slam winner yet. I'm, I'm working on it, you know. If you want to be, you're going to have to take risk. You're sure. going to have to take some big risk yeah. with your kid. Yeah. You know? And, and you just have to live with the consequences, you know, That's it. if you're just trying to develop a D one player, 
get a scholarship at a nice school or at an Ivy or something, it, I mean, can be a little safer. You'd be a little more conservative in the, the training. It's not that it's not that hard. If you have a decently yeah. gifted kid, if you if you train them right, it's not that hard to make D one somewhere. If you, you know, do a good job of the training, keep them healthy. You know, but uh, when you're going for the big the big dollars and yeah, the big yeah. the big world, like you, you're walking at tight rope, like yeah. like you're gonna take enormous. It's already a crazy idea just just to even think that your kid could like went be one of the greatest in the world you're gonna have to take tremendous risk to 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 do that something like that you know it's and a lot of you know a lot of kids won't make it you know it's just that's that's the way it is so i see it both ways i i, I hate injuries that you know I, i'm very i really care for my students i don't want them to get hurt but at the same time i want to give them the, i don't want to give them a training uh i don't want to give them set up their training in a way that they couldn't achieve with their goal like if i don't want to sell them short and, and give them training that's too conservative they have no chance to be great you know absolutely so how does that lead into like this suffering piece that we always hear about with the spanish with spanish tennis like what is suffering that is some people think it's controversial it, like it's just it is what it is in spain they have a culture of suffering uh, a fascinating discussion. Recently, a PhD professor contacted me. He's a professor of Spanish at Texas Christian University. He's telling me about how the idea of suffering goes back to the conquistadors of okay. Spain. Like it goes back many uh, centuries in, in Spain, including um, relating to the Catholic religion. And they had different reformations there. That, and he saw a lot of parallels between the way Rafa and Alcaraz. Uh, like their belief system, their their morals, and and the way they fight, and, and the the idea of suffering. He saw a lot of parallels from a historical context that I found I thought was fascinating. There's a lot of parallels uh, also to the suffering that the Spanish people underwent um, with Ferdinand Franco in, in you know with, with the, the the regime. They had a, there was a totalitarian regime in Spain for many decades, and. It, there was a brutal dictatorship from Franco. So the Spanish people went through literally a lot of suffering. And as soon as they gained their freedom, this uh, there was this uh, uh, incredible rise of Spanish tennis that grew out of this newfound uh, freedom, democratic freedom in the country. So it, it's a fascinating history, but it's just part of the ethos in Spain. It's part of the culture. It's part of the sporting culture. And everywhere you go in Spain, you hear those words. You hear... Coach, you, you don't normally hear that in the U.S. You know, like a coach yeah. is just telling a kid, hey, man, you know, you got to <laughs> suffer. You got to suffer today. Remember, uh, we work today. We're going to suffer. You know, it's just it's, it's, so I, I noticed that. And as I was going around the country originally, I was like, this is this is not like an accident. Like, this is like a theme that you see everywhere. And coaches just mention it a lot. So they train kids to believe to believe that, you know, that that tennis is a fight. And that you have to be tough and you have to, you never, you can never quit. You can never give up. You have to have this, uh, this tremendous spirit uh, of, of this fighting spirit. And, and that relates to being willing to suffer. You don't always have to win pretty, you know, sometimes the, the tough, basically the mindset is the tougher this gets, I like it more. Like the, the, t the worse this match gets, the more this guy is going to make me run. The more, you know, what's interesting, humility relates to suffering. Because in Spain, there's a, a parallel value of humility. It's a big part of the culture, the, the sporting culture. You, you need to be a humble fighter. And to suffer well, you need to be humble. Because a lot of kids don't want to run. They don't want to, they, they believe they're always better. Or they're too good to run. Their ego is too big. And so they just hit the ball really hard. Like if you, a lot of times you'll see it in the tournament, you'll see, like the rival will hit a tough shot. The kid will sort of run for it and then fire, try to fire a win. He's not really running. He's not really trying to like actually get, like extend the route. It's just, it's going to be over. Sometimes that's fitness too. If, if you don't have fitness, you usually go for broke as well because your heart rate's high and you know you can't continue. But but the mind, that that's not a mind. You have to, they, they try to cultivate humility along with this uh, spirit of suffering, this willingness to suffer. Those two values together. like. Okay, I, I'm in trouble here. I'm not going to be 
I, I'm not going to cry about it. I'm not going to make excuses about it. I'm going to chase this ball. I'm going to get it back in and I'm going to fight. I'm going to get, I'm going to try to do everything I can to get back in this point. And, and that, I, I, I love that. You know, maybe you hear some, some people say, well, I don't think you have to suffer to play tennis well. And I don't know if that's true or not. I'm sure there are players who are very good who don't like to suffer, but I just love that, that mentality. I agree. I don't know if that's like a controversial thing, but like, uh, is, it, is it a socioeconomic thing? <laughs> well, I, I don't, I think it can be especially depends on your environment when you're growing up culturally. Like, it, like I noticed a, kid, a lot of kids who play at country clubs, I always kind of joke about that. Like, sure. like the, it's just too soft an environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that, that environment will usually, the coddling environment where everything's like, lux, there's luxury. You can't have too much luxury if you want yeah. to learn to suffer. So like a lot of times I, I don't recommend kids play in the country club. They're better off in a performance environment. Like, you know, yeah. um, and, and, but I will tell you that I've had many kids from wealthy families who work like animals. Yeah. They suffer very, very well. And so I don't, I think it's more the parenting. Some of it may be genetic, but you can, you can come from a rich family and you can teach your kid to work and, and suffer and fight. I, I think that's not necessarily social economic, but you're right that you do see a lot when you're when you're poor, you have no money, and and the tennis is putting your bread on the table. It, it motivates you in a way that that that's hard to, you know, match if you're from a wealthy family or if you have everything taken care of. But some kids have that no matter what. It doesn't matter where they're from. They just hate to lose so much that they can find that inner drive. So I think it it's it's not so clear cut. Yeah, you know? no, definitely. Yeah. So I have a couple of questions as we're sort of winding down on this. One of the questions was, you know, um, what are, we'll go, I'll screen like that. What are, what's a top drill that a parent or coach could do with a player related, related to both, related to both acceleration, defense, and consistency? So are there, is there a key, is there a drill that you really like that a kid can do to work on, um, like let's say racket hit speed or acceleration or something like that? Yeah, so usually we talked about hand feeding. I, I recommend that. And any parent can do that. Any any coach who's just starting out can do that. You don't have to be an expert. And you just learn you learn how to grab some balls. And it's not, it seems seems easy, but it's actually a real art to hand feeding. You learn how to toss the balls in different ways. You can toss the ball downwards, you can toss the ball upwards, you can you can manipulate the ball in different ways, but I think learning to toss the balls from the hand, you see a lot of tour coaches do that when they're fine tuning things, even, even at the high level. It's a great way to, you can toss the balls around slowly and work on positioning and footwork. You can toss the balls quickly and work on reaction and speed and things like that. So I would say just learning some basic hand feeding and what you can do with the hand feeding, it takes a little more study, but you can learn some of the acceleration drills from the Bruguera system, which are very famous in Spain where you toss the ball in a, in a little bit more rapid succession to overload the body and to develop, develop more racket speed. So you can get racket speed done that way. You can work on your consistency that way and your movement and spacing. And um, the other drill that's a little harder, if you, if you have proficiency with the racket, so if you, if you have a tennis background, the other drill that's really, really famous in Spain that you see all the time and it's now proliferated all across the, the world and Spanish tennis is, is everywhere now. The, the, the concepts and the training, so you see the drills everywhere now. Uh, it wasn't always like that, you know, maybe 20 years ago when I first started going to Spain. And you see the wall where the coach volleys. That takes a lot of skill, though, so I don't often recommend it to, unless you have a tennis background. But the parent or the coach can volley the ball in different ways and different patterns to work on the player's racket speed, to overload the player, to work on consistency things like that. So those would be the two, hand feeding and the wall. La Pared is uh, uh, a very, very famous drill going back to Papa Alvarez and Luis Bruguera back in the 70s and 80s in Spain. Awesome. And then in terms of a drill, I mean, there's so many defensive positions you're put in in all these different these sort of like uncomfortable positions on the court. Is there a defensive drill? Or some, I mean, I think about people just defending out of the backhand corner being something that seems very you know, yeah, 
practice? Yeah, so I mean, yeah. just the, the most simple and famous drill for, for movement backward and defensively is the, the X drill. It's sometimes known as the Equis. And it's just an in and out. And sometimes in Spain, they call it the in and out. They have different names for it. And you just push a player, but you can do it with a racket. You can do it with, with your hands if you're just tossing the balls. And you can push a player back and, and they have to learn to retreat and give ground. And, and then accelerate on aggressive defense. And you, you can do it on both sides. And it's sort of like a half, uh, like a V shape or a half, sometimes it's called a half X. And then you bring, you can bring them in, which is the full X. It's just an X shaped movement. And to work on the, the ones laterally, there's a lot of simple drills you can do. You can toss the ball aggressively into a corner and ask a player to go out wide and then recover. And you can feed the ball with a racket or you can set up a ball machine to do that. Ball machine's great. I recommend ball machine to lots of parents who don't know how to play. Uh, there's like some little portable ball machines where that can simulate the hand feeding. And then there's obviously more robust ball machines that can feed the ball much harder and it's spin. And you can do a lot of those drills with ball machine or if you're somewhat competent with the racket, you can feed balls into the corners and work on defense. I was just in Spain and Luis Bruguer, he's getting very old, but he's still, he's still a genius. And he was taking the racket and he was hammering the ball into the corner and making the kids run like into the side fence, making them really suffer. And like, you know, you can do some stuff like that to cultivate like the defensive mentality. It's hard. Some kids don't want to run. Some kids don't, they, they just don't want They don't want to suffer. They don't want to endure any pain. And they don't want to. They don't want to run that much. They just want to hit the ball from yeah. the center hard, typically. Yeah. So nice. that can be tough. It's more like a mental block that you have to get over first. Like one of the funny things when I, I I bring a lot of players to Spain for training, and some of the first things that they used to do at Bruguera Academy, for example, is like they would just take the kid, like American kids, and just like throw. 10, 15 balls and yell at them to run. Like, just get over it. Like, just, just, it's not going to be pretty. You're going to be tired and it's going to hurt. And just like run for this one, run for that one, run for that one. And after the third or fourth ball, the kid's like, you want me to keep going? Like, you want me to... <laughs> Are you serious? I'm like, yeah. Like, we just want, like, get over it. Like, sometimes you just need to run and grind and get, get to something, you know? I'm getting old, man. When I was a kid, that's all I did was run around. <laughs> oh, no, but it's not it, like I said. There's no. You have to be humble. You, yeah. you just want to like hit winners and not move. Yeah. I mean, people. A lot of a lot of kids play tennis like that. It's not really. It's not. Those are not kids I really want to train. I want to train kids who are really animals. You know, that are, that are really gonna fight to the end and will do anything they can to get the ball back. Yeah. And uh, I think there's. Uh, there, there are some kids who just want to like hit some nice shots. Don't get too messy. Don't get too dirty. Don't 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 work too. Don't not too much pain. And and you know that's tennis for them. And I, I don't really see tennis that way. To me, tennis is like combat sport. You know, I'm really into MMA. I'm into martial arts. And for me, tennis is combat. You know. Yeah, I think, and I think you know, you get a lot of coaches who, you know, in their in the back of their mind, they're, you know. For the parents, Rick, check next month. It's about making it look pretty for making these kids look as good as possible on the court, too. You know, having some kid grinding out of the corners, trying to suffer and making it difficult for them and not maybe not seeing them at their best. You know, I think, yeah, I think it's not really that pretty, but that's not the majority of the point. Most kids should have weapons, like you get that beforehand, you know, like so. You hopefully, parents can see that you're we're trying to build big shots and and. You yeah. know, aggressive, aggressive tennis, but it's just when when the going gets tough and th- you know, yeah. like if it's it windy, if everyone, you know, if if it's hot, if if, yeah. if you're feeling sick, you know, like you, you just want to be able to just want to be able to gr- grind out some some, yeah. some matches, you know, exactly. when uh, you know when the shit hits the fan, you know, you, yeah. gotta, you gotta fight. It, it, it can't it, always be pretty. No, I mean, I mean so in, in most of these matches, the kids play a hundred matches in a year. How many of them are are pretty and everything works out as planned? You know. Yeah, but a lot of kids expect they think every match is going to be like if it's not like that, they're like, oh well, maybe next tournament. Like, no, yeah. like, come on, yeah, like, yeah, don't pack your bag. Just, just you know, get well, you the job done. Agility. I think you know, it's funny. We had last month. We had uh, 
Dr. Uh, Emily Wright on, we talked about, and she did sports psychologist, um, she works at IMG, and she's fantastic, and she does some work with Cam, and, uh, you know, we're talking about, you know, just this confidence, and you see the fragility in these kids, you know, and that one point can turn, or one ball can turn around the trajectory of these matches, because the, the mental piece isn't there, and you, you always see it as a parent, I see it as a parent, because I'm on the sideline, and you see, you know, particularly, I, I was on the bridge, I do Penn this weekend, watching these matches, and you see the kids who, you know, something goes wrong one point and immediately they look up to the bridge looking for their parents, like, and then it all falls apart, yeah. you know, and it's like this, you know, this, you just see it, you know, so, you know, I think that's a part. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, Rick Macy calls them marshmallow kids. You get yeah. kids like that. There's a lot of, there's a lot of research now and journal articles on grit. And, you know, and, and I love, I love that word, you know, it's like a passion and perseverance towards yeah. the goal, you know, like, like being willing to persevere. Yeah. Uh, I was just in Spain, a coach said, that, you know, I was talking about how I wrote a book on Spanish tennis. He was like, well, I, and he said, well, I think Spanish tennis is about perseverance. You know, and that was his perspective. And, and that's true. That's suffering. That's fighting spirit. Uh, the perseverance, like not never, never quitting when things get tough, you know, it sounds like a cliche, but you have to inculcate that. Like you have to develop that in your young kid uh, or I else they can get problem solving skills. Like how do you endure? Like how do you problem solve? I think that's, you know, like you said, like it gets hard and kids just say, okay, next tournament, next match. And they go, oh, you know, I don't know that to me is, I don't know what, it's a, that's a parenting thing, a coaching thing. I don't know what it is, but um, it's, it's all, it's, yeah. it's all those, it's all of those influences the parents obviously have a big influence on how they how they raise their kid how they develop the character the examples that parents set for the children i have four kids that the example that you set your kids are watching they see if, if you don't have perseverance if you don't have grit if if you make excuses your yeah. kids learn that you know if you yeah. if you give up easily your kids learn that from you if you or the opposite and you learn that from other role models usually the tennis coach is a huge role model so coaches are big role models for kids and they coaches help kids learn values and character. And I think the fitness is really important. So like you, you learn a lot of these values in tough fitness. Like, so a physical trainer can do a lot for a player's mentality. Uh, maybe it's more so I would argue maybe more so than a psychologist, you know, uh, a good trainer, a good, a good physical uh, strength and conditioning coach can do so much for a player and develop their competence, develop their, 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 their psychological uh, capacities, you know, their character, good, good strength and conditioning coaches do that very well. And then the kids will have confidence to do all these things that they want them to do on the tennis court, to fight, to suffer, to grind, to run. When they have, when they feel strong off the, off the court and their fitness, that, that gives them that, you know, I think that's a big factor. You know, also like as a parent, I think about the idea that, if, you know, it's also finding, it feels like it's also finding people who are on the same mission as you, who fit, who follow the same sort of like have these core tenants and these beliefs and the way that they operate. You know, I think it's why I think, you know, people say like, you know, your parents have a big influence and they do, but I, I often think, you know, our kids or our tennis players, whatever, they spend even more time with their peers than they spend with us in the course of a day sometimes. So it's also those people, we can influence our kids so much with the, with all these beliefs and these sort of strategies and tactics and try to help them as much as we can to see the guide them towards this pathway they, they want for themselves or these goals they want for themselves. But it's also their, their peers that they surround themselves who are influencing them through the course of the day. You know, you know, particularly yeah. with like tennis, it requires so much. And so not that all sports don't, but, you know, it just requires so much repetition and, you know, time, time and commitment it's easy for your buddies at school to say, hey, you know, wouldn't it be easier to go home and sit in the couch at three o'clock and play video games? Wouldn't it be easier to like go on vacation this weekend and like forget about tennis? You know, wouldn't it be easier to do all these different things? And I think so that to me is also part of it too. Like you yeah, having the right, you know, peer group around you also that, that supports what you're trying to accomplish. If you want to be at the highest level, if you want to play at, a, at a, like you said, at a different level, maybe high school tennis is what you want to play or something like that. It might not require as much. You know, it might not require as much as that, but are you know, but um, to, to I do think it that's a that's a good point. The peer group matters. That's why if you ha want your kid to do high performance, don't put them in the country club. You know, mm -hmm. don't put them in that environment. The environment matters, and so parents can help by trying to 
keep their kids around, you know, always in a demanding environment, always with other kids who have big, big aspirations and always around kids who are hardworking. And when kids see that around them, they, they will flourish. I took one of my young players to Spain a couple of times this summer and we, we trained at a very, um, very uh, t- tough academy where they, there was just an expectation that everyone there was going to work really hard. And she flourished. She loved it. And she was surrounded by all these serious players. And it was an amazing experience for her. And that's kind of what you're talking about. Everyone around her was pushing, pushing, pushing hard and pretty disciplined. And that had a positive effect on her character. You know? Yeah, no, that, that, that feels like, like that's it. You know, that, that peer group is, is really important to make sure people, you know, can stay on the same path. That's why I would say when I, you know, when, when Cam and my son's coming to, you know, your Saturday, like your, your, assuming your Sunday, those, those group high performance groups with like the high performance juniors, high school, college players, like it's great to get in there for hours and just battle, just fight every point when you're, you're, you're making those matchups and having kids just grind it out and fight and battle for like, you know, against each other. Like it gets intense and it's fun and it's, you, you feel like you're in that environment. It's like everybody's, you know, no one's trying to give an inch kind of, you know, yeah, that, that, that can be a weak link in a lot of kids development. I, um, a lot of kids are not, maybe if your if your player's not making the progress that you expect, it could be from a, a lot of times that there's a weak link in the groups, you know, they're, they're training in groups, but the group, the kids around your player are, are not working hard enough, or maybe the level is not good. So the, 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 the type, you, you may be in a group, but it might not be a good quality group. And parents really have to watch out for that. Sure. It's easy to want to say, you know, you know, it's kind of like you want to be like the dumbest person in the room. You almost want to be the worst player on the court and have to like, fight it out with all these top players. You know, um, I think sometimes yeah. like parents, parents own egos get in the way of that too. And they, they, they like the fact the kid's the best kid in the group, but you know, you're sort of like the big fish in a small pond, you know? I think the smart parents always want to be the, the lower kid in the group. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I like, I like to think so, but yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. But, um, all right. Um, We've taken up way too much of your time this evening. And you just ran off court to get nice, to- uh, nice conversation. I enjoyed it. Yeah, likewise. It's always great. 